In this short video, we're going to talk about linear transformations between general vector spaces. So we already talked about linear transformations between Euclidean spaces. Let's see what differs. Certainly not in the uh, definition. Uh, it's going to be essentially the same definition. A linear transformation is still going to be a function. Uh, so it's going to be a function, the domain is going to be a vector space V. It may have its own vector addition and scalar multiplication defined. That's what the subscript V means on the O plus and the O dot. And then the codomain is going to be another vector space W, which could have different addition and multiplication. So for example, the domain, the input space, could be a Euclidean vector space. The output space could be a function vector space. But the transformation is still a function, so every vector in V is mapped to some vector in W. And in order to make it a linear transformation, uh, we have to have both the additivity property and the homogeneity property. That means that if you in the input, you have the sum of two vectors, and the sum is taken with respect to the input definition of sum. Then the output is the sum of the images using the output definition of sum. And the same idea with scalar multiplication for homogeneity. Now, that's a lot of notation. You've got O dots and O pluses now with subscripts and almost always it's going to be clear what the uh, appropriate vector addition and scalar multiplication is so to clean things up we're just going to use the regular plus sign and just use the regular notation for scalar mu uh, multiplication. So again, the input space is still called the domain, and every vector in the domain gets mapped to something. Uh, the output space is called the codomain. Maybe, maybe not everything in the codomain is, is mapped. A vector space linear transformation is also called a vector space homomorphism. And if you have the same vector space for the domain and the codomain, then we still call it a linear operator. And for finite dimensional vector spaces, we can still find a standard matrix for the linear transformation, but we will look at that in the next few sections. Let's just look at some very simple linear transformations between vector spaces. Uh, we still have a zero transformation. What that does is map every vector in V to the appropriate zero vector in W. So in that case, clearly only one vector uh, is targeted in W, the zero vector. Uh, with the identity operator, it has to be an operator because every vector gets mapped onto itself. And then we have the scaling operator where every vector gets mapped onto a constant multiple of itself. Now we have something new that we didn't see before in Euclidean spaces because we didn't have functions as inputs, but this is a way that we can create a, a linear transformation when the function is an input. So we're going to assume the function is defined on an interval i, and we're going to choose a real number a. And for any function which is defined on that interval, then the value f of a exists, and it's a real number. So the, just the act of evaluating will be the action of our linear transformation. So your input is a function, and your output is a real number, it's the value of the function at that real number. We can see that uh, this is a linear transformation just because of the function properties uh, that you, evaluating f plus g at a is defined as f of a plus g of a uh, and um, 
which is the same as evaluating uh, f at a and then evaluating g at a. And uh, same thing with scalar multiplication. Now, we want to be clear that th we're not assuming that f and g themselves have any additivity or any uh, homogeneity. We're just saying that evaluating them at one particular uh, value is uh, using this evaluation transformation satisfies additivity and homogeneity. So let's look at an example. So in this case, we're going to choose A to be the real number 1. And so the name of our transformation will be E sub 1. And the input function in our first example is x squared minus 3x plus 5. And so I'll just replace x with 1. That gives me my output value. And again, E sub 1 of log of x would be log of 1, which is 0. E sub 1 of cosine pi x would be cosine of pi, which is negative 1. Now, you can extend this idea to have multiple values. And so, if we had three numbers, for example, we could put them in a vector A. And then the output from this type of evaluation transform would be a vector. And the components of the vector would be the values of the function at those uh, numbers, which are the components of the vector A. So, for example, if our A vector has the components negative 1, 0, 1, then if I were to evaluate x squared minus 4x using this transformation, then the first component of the output would be, well, negative 1 squared minus 4 times negative 1, which gives me 5. And then if I put in 0, I'll get the second component, which would be 0 minus 0. And then finally, if I replace x with 1 that in the function definition, then I'll get my third component. And the same idea here, a different function, arc sine of x, but it's defined for negative 1, 0, and 1. And so the value of arc sine of negative 1 is negative pi over 2, the arc sine of 0 is 0, and the arc sine of 1 is pi over 2. We started our discussion about general real vector spaces noting that differentiation and integration, those actions from calculus, both satisfied uh, additivity and homogeneity. So we should be able to define a linear transformation or more linear transformations based on those operations. So let's review some notation. C1 of i means that that's the set of functions that have continuous first derivatives on that particular interval. So we can define the differentiation transformation D, and its domain is going to be uh, the set of functions with continuous derivatives. And so that means after you take the derivative, you'll get a continuous function. And the action is just to take the derivative. So for example, d of x squared minus 3x plus 5 would be its derivative 2x minus 3. d of cosine of x would be negative sine of x. What about integration? Well, now we can just use the set of continuous functions on a closed interval as our input space. And if I'm performing a definite integral, then my output is going to be a real number. Uh, and uh, the definite integral even is defined for every continuous function on that closed interval, even if it doesn't have an antiderivative. So the linear transformation, we're going to call it def. So we're going to use three letters to represent the uh, definite integral transformation. Again, its input will be a function. Its output will be the real number, which is the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. 
So, for example, def of cosine of x on the interval negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 would be the value of the definite integral from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 of cosine of x dx, which if we work it out, turns out to be the integer 2. What about indefinite integrals? Well, the output from an indefinite integral is a function. In order to um, make it a the transformation well-defined so that you only get one function instead of a family of function as the output, we're going to define it in terms of an evaluation starting from our endpoint A going to the point X. So our interval is from uh, A to B. And we're going to uh, define it as this evaluation so that there is no plus C. And we know that the output function defined this way will be differentiable from the fundamental theorem of calculus. So the indefinite or end of 3x squared minus 2 would be the uh, indefinite integral. And these are ones that we know the antiderivative of. So it would just be x cubed minus x squared for 3x squared minus 2x. And the indefinite integral of cosine of 2x would be 1 half sine of 2x. So let's go back to the derivative. Suppose you have a set of functions, w, where the derivative of every function in w also belongs to w. In that case, the derivative linear transformation is going to be a linear operator on w. So the input space is w, and, and the output space is w. The derivative of anything in w is another function in w. And here's an example. I know that any function in span of w is a linear combination of these three functions, x squared e to the negative 3x, x e to the negative 3x, and e to the negative 3x. So what if I were to take its derivative? Well, let's just do it one term at a time. If I take the derivative of my first function, using the product rule and chain rule, what I get is a linear combination of two functions which are in w. I have 2 times x e to the negative 3x. x e to the negative 3x is in w negative 3 x squared e to the negative 3x, which is also in w. Remember, w is the span of those functions, so any linear combination belongs to w. And we see the same thing when I take the derivative of this second function. And finally, the uh, third uh, function, when I take its derivative, it is just a multiple of itself. And at this point, you should be able to convince yourself that this set of functions that we're using to span the space is not only a spanning set, but it is linearly independent, so it would be a basis for w as well. We can still define a kernel and a range for a given linear transformation. The kernel is defined in the same way. It's going to be the set of vectors in V, so in the input space, in the domain, which get mapped to zero in the output space, whatever the zero vector is in W. And the kernel is never empty. It always contains the appropriate zero vector in V. Uh, a linear transformation will always map the zero vector in V to the zero vector in W. That is a result of both the additivity and homogeneity properties. So it's important to remember that the kernel is a subspace of the domain. Every 
object in the kernel, every vector in the kernel, is a vector in the domain. The range is just the set of all the images under the linear transformation. So the range lives in the output space. Everything in the range is in the codomain. And both the kernel and the range are subspaces, but they're subspaces in different vector spaces. So an example would be, let's find the kernel of our differentiation transformation. That would mean we'd want to know, well, what is the zero vector when we're talking about the vector space of continuous functions? The zero vector would be the zero function z of x. So we'd like to find all the functions which have a continuous uh, first derivative, and that continuous first derivative is z of x. Well, from calculus, we know that the only such functions are constant functions. We know that the derivative of a constant function is the zero function. And uh, so any kernel in D would be multiple of the function f of x equals 1. So that's why we can write that the kernel of D is the span of 1. In this case, the 1 represents the function f of x equals 1. It doesn't represent a real number 1. So we'll learn more about uh, linear transformations and their properties in uh, the future sections in this chapter.